Well, I'm very pleased to introduce my best neighbor. I'm your only neighbor. <laughs> my only neighbor, right? It's not often you get to have a ham living right next door. And we have a battle of antennas going on right now. He's winning. <laughs> yeah, but you're coming up fast. Yeah, he's building a four square for 75 meters this coming winter, so he's going to up the tower count on me. That's right. And anyway, David is uh, also interested not only in DXing, he likes to do the the expeditions, but he's been very interested in Drake Radio for a number of years and is a um, uh, great restorer. He's, he's got a number of rigs that he's got in the queue right now, and he wants to talk to you about a really important one. <clears throat> Thank you. I can put this one down, right? Yeah. You got it wired up. Good. Thank you, and I appreciate the ability to be here. I have my glasses off, so if you raise your hand for a question, make sure you raise it and wave it, because I won't be able to see it otherwise. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some Drake history first. Okay, it's the up. <clears throat> some of my friends have come to this meeting, I can see. <laughs> Uh, the R.L. Drake Company had its beginnings in early 1940s when the first product was the F-15U bandpass filter. It was followed with a simple tube receiver, the BC-125A. I've only seen pictures of these. I've never seen one at the beginning. After the war, the contract orders fulfilled. Drake Company was made table lamps for the S.S. Kresge Company. Remember those? It was difficult to keep the employees busy. Mr. Bob Drank was looking for a way to keep the company together. I can imagine that. Those of you who ran a company, uh, you made your money when the people that had working for you were busy. In the background, radio, uh, in the growth of ham radio after the war, the company began making accessories for the ham market. Factory-built radios were becoming available and the makers Hamland, Holocrafters, National were making big ticket items for the growing ham market. It's the, it's the other down. <laughs> to support this emerging market, Drake made some interesting little accessories. A Q multiplier add-on for the receivers that other people were making. Product detectors that were applicable to the new voice mode, SSB. I tried that one time. It, it's okay. <laughs> and made an early phone patch that connected the receiver and the transmitter to the telephone. Next thing you know, if they had stayed in business, they would have put something in your pocket that would actually ring when your wife wanted to call you. Huh? What would that be? That would be a really pain in the pocket. <laughs> Bob Drake was fascinated with the SSB mode and started to look for staff that would support the design and manufacturing of newer devices for the ham market. Engineers were hired and development began. It seems to be a trend of at least the Drake company that I've looked at, that when they had a new idea, he went out and hired engineers that were bright and savvy and enthusiastic enough to be able to develop it. Radios were heavy, large boat anchor assemblies, and you're going to see a bunch of those that advertised as the heaviest, the biggest, and therefore the best radios. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. It was actual advertisement that says, we are the heaviest, the biggest, and therefore the best. Drake was not convinced that this approach was correct, and they developed the 1A. It was built in for SSB service, placed in service in the late 1957. You've seen 1As before. They're about this big. They're about, they're about the size of three stacked loaves of bread. Now, I'm not talking about the honey wheat bread. I'm talking about the one that has all the stuff in it that you're supposed to avoid. It was smaller, lighter than the contemporary receivers, and generally for SSB outperformed them. You could even pick it up yourself and tuck it under your arm. At first, Bob Drake had a problem selling the radio. Nobody believed in Drake. Nobody believed that if it wasn't heavy and if it wasn't big, it wouldn't sell. And he had to convince the people 
that this was actually a good product. He, he couldn't sell it himself, so he had to put them in stores to sell them. Next up in 1959 was the 2A, followed by the 2B and 61, and then in 1967, the 2C. They were soaked up as fast as Drake could make them. The difference was that in the SSB area was firmly taking hold in the ham industry. Even with the continued use of AM transmission, the two series had enhanced AM receive accessories like the Q multiplier, the crystal calibrator, and eventually followed by the matching transmitters allowed Drake to firmly grab a portion as the top manufacturers of SSB market. They made them and they sold them quickly. The 2NT transmitter, which is on the left, was added after the 2B was introduced. But as it was designed for the novice class of crystal controlled operation, it was not a big seller. But it started a trend that Drake said, well, let's see if we can build some transmitters to match up with our receivers. During the production of the two series radios, the next adventure was a transceiver. You mean everything is in one box? And you only had one big knob? What is the world coming to? This was a radical approach. And the separate transmitter and receiver units, which required you to have a very large and heavily built table to put them on, uh, were kind of put on edge with the TR3. It's not the very first transceiver, but it was following the line of compact, smaller, and lighter radios that Drake had developed. And it's still a pretty radio. Mm -hmm. What year was this? That was 63. Tube size. Oh, yes, tubes. Oh, John, please. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I don't like this. <laughs> uh, I, I did the arithmetic that help them make cheap, but I, I don't want uh, to talk about transistors. The TR3 also dealt another blow to the big heavy separates that were still being produced. While the TR3 was the first lightweight transceiver radio out, this Cosmophone 35 was actually the first transceiver and it featured two separate VFOs. The TR3 was SSB and CW with controlled carrier AM and key down produced 180 watts. The big heavy boat anchors didn't do that. TR3 was out in 63 and changed the way that radios were packaged and sold. Many, many were made, sold, and still used today. I have two of them in various stages uh, in my shack. The TR3, then the TR4, then the TR4C, and the TR4CW, and the last of the line was the TR4CWRIT. Thousands were sold. This is the TR4 CWRIT. It's the last of the line of the tube transceivers that Drake made. Production started in 1977. Only 2,500 are made. And since time has taken its toll, this radio is considered somewhat rare. Not, David, as rare as your little beauties here, but <laughs> rare nonetheless. This radio was made in the same factory at the same time as they were making the TR-7. This one is sitting on my bench. During the production of the TR line, Drake went back to the separate receiver and transmitter scheme. These started off with the R4 receiver in 65, the R4A, the R4B, and the final version was R4C introduced in 1973. The C was a completely different receiver. Looked the same, but the inside was quite different. For the transmitters, the units with a T4 didn't have a VFO, T4X, T4XB, and the final version T4XC. Each of these were the same general electrical design. More and more, John, solid state stuff kept creeping in on it. Uh, and Mr. Bob Sherwood back there, who I have probably corresponded with him for probably 40 years, first time I ever met him, fixed some of the problems in the R4C. And, and believe me, I've 
believe it or not, people are still buying those tickets. Can you imagine that all these decades later? Yeah, I know. I just got a box from you the other day. <laughs> this, <laughs> the sea lions, I, I, I think I paid for them. <laughs> the sea lion twins, as they are called, offer a high degree of selectivity. Robert Sherwood, I'm getting you a little advertisement here, Bob. Robert Sherwood increased the R4C effectiveness drastically when he created a filter in the first IF. The 600 cycle filter increased the dynamic range that greatly enhanced the performance of the R4C in CW. When I got my C-line, it didn't have it. And I said, well, you know, this is okay. It's, it's better than an ICO 753. Uh, <laughs> You just, <laughs> but it just, it, it lacked a little verb to it. So Rob came up with a, uh, a 600 cycle and also a 1.8 mega cycle for sideband. I, I didn't buy that one. And these were relay switched and it was not until the 10 tech Orion radio, which came out in the mid eighties that these filters, these uh, filter arrangements were called roofing filters. But the concept started with Rob, who we have here today. Thank you, Rob, for making the trip. <laughs> There's the Sea Lion Twins at, at my station. I worked 330 contract, contacts on that, countries. 90 watts on CW. These have the Sherwood filters in it, the first IF stage, and they are my best radio. I've got a shack full of boxes and these are my favorites. I went from the Halicraft as SX100 to an R4B and then to this, this and I said, I've hit, I've got to the top. I just need to hold on and hit the key. <laughs> What's up with that in the upper left corner there? <laughs> that is an MFJ memory keyer. Okay. Uh, when you get to be my age, some things don't work. <laughs> I see that some of them understand that. And uh, the keyer helps me out. <laughs> Drake did some contract work for the government, <clears throat> just like they produced the, uh, the S2 line. They did some contract work. This is an example of one of the products made for use in the Southeast Asia area in 1968. Let me see, carry the one. Yeah. Divided by, oh yeah, I know that way. Note that the TR44B is a marriage of the T4 transmitter, no VFO, and the R4B receiver. It's a transceiver that will accept crystal frequency control from one and a half to 30 megahertz. This one is a W5XU. Right now it's all apart because the receiver's got a little glitch that I found the other day, and I'm gonna put it back together. This one is at my shack. And it's only one of four that I know of. Where's Richard? Richard's got the other three. <laughs> Drake also advertised the TR44C. Have you seen one of those, Richard? I've seen somebody claim they have one, but I've never seen one. I've never seen one in, in real life. Uh, but if one comes up, I hope I get to it before you. <laughs> uh, Drake TR6. And remote VFO, this was their entry into the six meters. Uh, it was basically a TR4 uh, converted into six meters. It's a nice little radio. It's interesting to note that the power supplies for the TR3, the TR4, the T4 series of transmitters and transceivers were nearly all the same and they're all interchangeable. First was the AC3, then the AC4, they're all interchangeable. Uh, this, this helped promote the line because they could develop a new transmitter as long as it had the same power supply. There was no developmental problems with that. I've seen AC4 serial numbers in the 84,000 range. That's a lot of boxes. By now, Drake was firmly established as a successful and sought after maker of amateur radio equipment but the computer age was coming. <clears throat> I'm gonna try not to choke. <laughs> the computer age was coming into play at the solid state revolution was becoming commonplace. Drake had to move with the times. 
the result was the TR7. It was a handsome radio, 180 watts key down. Where did that come from? Oh, yeah, the T4 transmitters had 180 watts key down. Better do that again. Nobody's going to like that lack of power. Offered in available modes and possibility of general coverage with some accessories. It sold fairly well. The seven line at my station, the TR7 and the R7 receiver, both were made in 1977. State of the art when they were introduced and they were in heavy demand. Drake had a winner. The TR7 produced 180 watts, key down, all modes, and with the factory AUX7 board, could cover any 500 kilohertz portion between zero and 30 megahertz. But production costs were high and the Japanese competition was hard to price beat. So Drake decided to make a less expensive model, the TR5. If you remember back in history, <laughs> some of you are very historic, but if you can remember back in history, um, when, the, when the states would make a new invention, Bob, you'll appreciate this, I'm looking at you, uh, Ampex came out with an invention they called the video tape recorder. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Video tape recorder. It was a huge machine, about this high, six or seven feet wide, driven by compressed air. The Japanese took that, stole the design, and made one that was this big. Instead of using two-inch tape, they used one-inch tape and completely ruined the market for Ampex. Ampex went out of business. You remember a small little company named Sony? Mm -hmm. Remember what they did to televisions? Mm -hmm. We don't make TVs anymore. If you want a TV, you got to get a Sony made in Japan or someplace in Singapore or <coughs> China. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the TR7 this TR7 it's a beauty. I just finished restoring it. I've had it on the air. If you go to the Boat Anchors Net on Wednesdays, uh, you have heard this radio. This radio was made in the third week of the production of the series. It's very, very early, 1977. And this is the TR7. It's beautiful. It was a pleasure working on it. I like working on these radios. I'm, I'm going to sell this radio one day and, and a couple of others that I have ready to go. The issue is, though, you, you don't do this boat anchor stuff to make a profit. Has, has, has anybody spent hours and hours fixing a radio and then sold it and got a profit out of it? <laughs> no, you don't. But in the meantime, you're learning about the why this radio is supposed to work, or at least trying to. And I'm still doing it. I have nine of these, and I'm still trying to figure out some of the circuitry and why it's supposed to work that way. The fact that it does, I'm grateful. I just don't know why. So after the TR7 came the TR5. Hmm, kind of looks like a TR7. It's the same physical size. And it was introduced in 1981. It's essentially a TR4 that was transistorized. It had the work bands, all solid state. Only about three of them exist today. You know why? Drake made them and couldn't sell them. Why? It only produced 80 watts. Oh, what had happened at that, that, that 180-watt business that you've all been doing for decades? 80 watts is not going to cut it. If I want 80 watts, I'll go to Japan and buy one. It was selling for $800, and it just wouldn't sell. Nobody would buy it. The knob worked backwards from the TR7. <laughs> it didn't sell. Drake said, called up HRO. HRO came down took all of the produced TR5s, all the spare parts, all the boards, all the pieces and parts, all of it. Took it, put it on a truck, 
brought it back to the factory. On the way, the truck got into an accident, and there were TR5s all over the highway. Now, Bill, there were no tanks available to roll over, <laughs> but nonetheless, there are about 300 of these in the world that I guess there's some on the side of the road, but I'm not quite sure. <laughs> anyway. No pass-band tuning, right? Uh, it, did, it did not have pass-band tuning. That's correct. And the, uh, the, uh, the, the push buttons were gone, and the little rocker switches up here were substituting for the push buttons. The push buttons in the TR-7 gave, gave them trouble. Drake produced a series of amplifiers, the L4, the L4B on the left, the L7 on the right, and finally the L75. The L75 had one 3-500, the others had two of them. L7 and the L75 at 160 meters, and all with the modification could go to 10 meters as well. They were very stable amps, much in demand then and now, these are the ones that are sitting on my shack. Production history of Drake. 1957 with the 1A, all the way up to 1981, they produced some specialized radios. And the TR5, which was the last thing that they produced uh, in the factory. In the meantime, Collins introduced a 388 receiver, the transceiver. Several Japanese makers were starting to flood the market with radios. I wonder whether Sony had anything to do with that. It was hard for time for Drake as a product line apparently became stale, and Drake was losing market share. It was not the quality of the, pro of the radios. It was the cost. The Japanese were just outselling them. Even with all the competition, the synthesized TR5 had the lowest phase noise in the industry to that time. It cost $800, but you could go buy a Japanese radio for $500, and that's what basically killed it. They couldn't sell them. In the early 1980s, the TR5, by the way, there's about 300 left, and they're kind of hard to find. In the early 1980s, Drake started into design and production of satellite receivers, and the production shifted to these. When Bob Drake died, his son took over the company. He changed the focus into the satellite market. In the radio days, the total factory output of the TR-7 was about 10,000 units, and that spanned uh, from 1977 to 1982. <coughs> TR-7A was about 2,500. When production started in the satellite receivers, the factory was making about 15,000 units a month. The face of the company was changing. But what about the research and what about the new radios that were planned as the TR-7 and the TR-5 replacement? What happened to this effort? Hmm. The Drake TR-7, which you see a nice example right there. A total of some 12,500 were made. Two versions, the 7 and the 7A. The 7A basically had all the options that the TR-7 had available to it. After the poor showing of the TR-5, the waning years of the TR-7, Drake put some research into a new radio. It was to include the warp bands, like the TR-5, TR-5 had all the work bands in it, an upgraded synthesized VFO like the TR-5. They couldn't get the synthesized VFO working in time to put it into the TR-7. So they finished developing it and put it into the TR-5. And the TR-5 was the first one to have it. A new auto antenna tuner, notch filter, lots of features of the TR-7. It would have been the next step preparing for the 1990s. At Drake, the engineers Steve Kugler and Neil Lassant were asked to come up with the successor of the TR-7, TR-5 area. They began their research, computers. And they had planned upgrades to include the modern features in demand of the amateur industry. 
They were playing catch up with the Japanese and wanted to leap ahead. The Kugler uh, Lassant prototype until the late 1980s when Drake made the decision to get out of the amateur radio market. They just said, shut it down, no more ham radio, we out of the business. All the stuff that you did, throw it away, uh, go rent a tank and roll over it. <laughs> Eventually the documentation for the prototype was destroyed and the equipment gathered for the prototype was scrapped. This was in 1982 when the last of the TR-7s were produced and that was it. It was over. But, do I hear a drum roll? Wait, there's a drum roll. <laughs> oh, looky here. Looks like a TR-7. Mm, smells like a TR-7. Mm, the rear end definitely looks like a TR-7. But, apparently some research did survive. This is the first prototype of the TR-8. I dub it as the a, a TR-7B, that's my nomenclature. As it's nearly identical to the TR-7. It's got the same frequency IF makeup, same filtering in the second IF, same power amplifier, it even uses the same PS7 power supply. The, what is different is the VFO and the synthesizing of the signals in the display. It's all microprocessor controlled. <laughs> it has the beginnings of what looks like a notch filter. The original TR7 did not have a notch filter. As in the TR7, it's all solid state. This, I believe, was the proof of concept for the TR-8. I don't know if there's any others like this. I think this is one of a kind. So, I don't want to make you feel bad, boys. <laughs> the TR-8, the TR-7B, proof of concept radio. Note the TR-7 look. It has the 1980 code stamped on some of the components, which means this box started out as a TR-7, late production, and it was used for the new concept. This radio, uh, you plug it in, it lights up, it transmits, and I haven't put it on the air yet, <laughs> but I will. I'm gonna get that one, I'm gonna get that one ready to go. But wait, there's more. The drum roll, please. The true TR-8, there is it, right there. No tank marks on it. it how you look at it is how I got it. It's about three inches longer than the TR-7. The DR-7 board is completely gone. There's a lot of little roaches right up in there that have the encoder wheel, takes care of the display and all the frequency synthesizing. The rest of the radio seems to be similar to a TR-7. This has a noise blanker in it. Uh, it's got all the features of the TR7 and TR5. There's no band switch. How the hell you change bands? Oh, that's right. We're in the computer mode. You just push a button. Next thing you know, they're going to be putting telephones in your pocket. It also covers the work bands and has a position on the mode switch for FM. How about that? No longer has a selectable AGC button. I suspect as you select a mode, you select the AGC. 
Split operation with an R7 receiver or it's internal. It has a push button AC on instead of the rotary switch, which gave Drake a lot of trouble. It uses the same design and format for the power amplifier, so the 180 watts is preserved. Yes. In the traditional Drake way, it uses the PS7 power supply. This unit is marked XXX2, which suggests that it's probably the second TR8 prototype. Likely not a third. Uh, there is an XX1 that I suspect. He was at the Shelby Ham Fest. I wasn't there. My best neighbor. I got my head down, all right? <laughs> That's right. A little, a little shed of tears. He was walking by the tables and said, hmm, there's another Drake radio. The box says TR8. Hmm. What's next? <sighs> That's OK. When you go, no, I only have one neighbor, and I can't afford to be mad at him. He's got all the parts. <laughs> <laughs> but we suspect, and Nick saw, that probably XXX1. You'll note when you come up and look at it that the front panel is incomplete. The band switch is gone. Push a button, change bands. I called some of the former Drake engineers and emailed some of them. Very little contact was made. Most of them just didn't respond. One, John Kreiner, responded to me and told me that all documentation was destroyed, so I was on my own. If anybody knows of any documentation on this radio, I would be very beholding. This is the TRA prototype right there. Note the missing band switch. Just push a button to change uh, bands. It's got a VFO A and B control. Hmm, that's interesting. Has split inside, split operation inside the box, just like the old Omni series from Tentec. One VFO, which you can operate split. It has 1982 code stamp on the components. This one is. I would say is nearly operational. It works on some bands. I plugged it in, turned it on, <laughs> and I released no smoke. I was telling my children <clears throat> the story about smoke. And smoke is a, uh, is, a, is a manufactured ingredient that all radios have. They have smoke that is put into radios, and some smoke has the ability to change bands. Some smoke has the ability to receive. It's a very special smoke that has the ability to transmit. Without the smoke, that function is gone. So when something happens to the radio and you have a smoke, I'm going to get out of your speaker there, Bob, so I don't feed back, <clears throat> whatever that is. So when the smoke is let out, you can't do it. And I said, now, these kinds of radios right here, it's very difficult to find out where the smoke came out of, much less try to replace it because these little dead roaches inside of there are very difficult to replace. But over here, where you have a radio that has these tubes in it, this was the manufacturer's way of renewing the smoke. <laughs> so you find the one that released the smoke, and you put it into the big box in the corner of the shack, and then you put another one in there that renews the type of smoke that it needed, and all of a sudden the radio works. And they said, wow, really, Dad? Mmm, you full of baloney. <laughs> the TR-8. Notice that the DR-7 board is now gone, and the plug-in boards use a different pin arrangement than the Molex boards of the TR-7. If you've worked with TR-7s before, the first thing that you do when you open up a radio, you take the boards out, you put a drop of deoxid on each one of the pins, put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out. If it had a problem, then you might have 
you might have fixed the problem at that point. It was Drake's way of providing the means to reestablish the smoke inside of a TR-7. You see how important smoke is? The, TR the TR-7B, which is this one, and the TR-8 serial XXX2. You'll notice that the radios have the same profile in the front, but this box is about three inches longer. The front end filtering on the TR-7 is right here. Here, it's all in a much bigger compartment and it's all relay controlled. No documentation, zero, that I can find yet. The TR-7 on the top, you see the big uh, DR-7 board. The TR-8B on the box still has the, TR, the DR-7 board, but it looks different. Oh, that's a, what is that big old roach there in the middle? Hmm, it must, oh yeah, it's one of them 8308As. Mm. Yeah, even then. And finally, drum please. This is going to change my voice. And finally, to round out the TR-8 line, Drake produced one of the new matching amplifiers. As far as I know, that's the only one that exists. It's the TR, it it's matches the TR-7, I mean the TR-75, it was made from the TR-75. It's bigger, and they call it the, T, the L-85. It has all the bands, including the Warwick bands, has a relay switched input filtering, which the L75 did not have. Still one tube, really, really nice heavy band switch. All the chassis pieces and cupboards are gone. And I wonder, hmm, I wonder if they ever made them. But no problem, my neighbor has a break. <laughs> And all we need to do is figure out how it was supposed to be. The code on this transformer is July of 1996. So they were dealing with this transition up until then. So you've walked with me down the road uh, for the, the Drake history. Uh, it's been a long road. I will endeavor to make these radios functional. It's a piece of history that I'm glad to be a part of. There's no more Drake radio for amateurs to dream after. You remember when you were a young ham? <laughs> I know at one time I was. When you were a young ham and you were looking at the magazines and you saw Drake, I said, man, look at that thing, boy. And you take the ruler out, your mama's ruler that she would use to mend your clothes with, and you would measure the desk to see if it would fit. You remember that? Yeah. I see you smiling. Of course you do. <laughs> and you ever got one? One day my daddy asked me, son, what do you want for Christmas? I was ready. <laughs> I said, daddy, uh, Drake makes a new receiver. It's called the R4. I would like one of those. He said, okay, well, I'll call up Southern Radio in New Orleans and see if they got something like that. Well, Christmas came around. I opened up the, the, the wrapping on it and I saw Drake and I said, calm thyself, heart. And it was at R4B. And I said, oh man, what is, what is this? I said, I told my daddy an R4. Well, he didn't have any of those, so this was supposed to be the next one in line. And it was one of the very first R4 
bees, which I still have. We must have had the same daddy. Huh? We must have had the same daddy. Huh? Well, I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> that would make us brothers. Wait a minute. <laughs> Oh, man, I tell you, it, it, it was, I plugged that in, and I turned it on. I said, whoa, whoa, this radio really works. Somebody must have fixed my antenna. <laughs> All right, brother, give the man an S2. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, any questions? Richard. I don't know. I don't think so. I've never seen, I've seen some made up that looked just like it. I don't think they did. The others, what, have, what about the Drake uh, R8s? Well, the Drake R8s were the Drake R8s were for the mostly for the SWL market, and they made an R8, an R8A, and an R8B, and they were in production on a separate line, but they didn't manufacture many of them. They were uh, mostly for SWLs. Uh, they were a, a fairly good receiver, but they were not really ham receivers. I knew that they, they supported those for a while. Yes. And I was able to get some uh, original shipping containers, and I wanted to throw some of them out of the And they could still get the MS-8 speaker, I think it was called, from them also. Kind of well, that would make sense because on the TR-7, the, the speaker was the MS-7. Yeah. Yes, sir. They always seem to have Drake parts and pieces. Uh, I did. Uh, when I went to Dayton, uh, I would go to the to the um, uh, to the forums. I heard Mr. Sherwood give some of his talks, uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed them. And when I'd walk up to somebody and say, "You know, I've got this." And I need this and this and this. They said, we can't help you. I mean, Drake's out of business. Nobody has parts. So I tried getting on the, um, the Drake sideband thing. Uh, and that said the same thing. Oh, wait, nobody has parts for that. We'll, we'll put it out. And, and if you have, somebody has a, a spare part around there, they'll, they'll contact you. The best way to handle parts for a Drake radio is to go to ham fests and buy another one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, it pains me. I have nine of these TR7s. And I go up to them and I touch them. And I said, everything is going to be OK. <laughs> and I touch this one. Everything is going to be OK, I think. Everything, I don't know about you, but I think it's going to be OK. And this one, I say, you better work. <laughs> so. You, in, in, in my estimation, it's good to have a couple of radios of whatever you're working on that could be sacrificial for the rest. The TR-44B, it had a bad uh, carrier oscillator crystal. Same crystal that was in an R4C. I happen to have an R4C that was a swimmer. A swimmer is a radio that uh, for one purpose or another was underwater. <laughs> Down here in the south, that is not a trivial exercise. So I took the crystal out of it. Crystal is supposed to be sealed, right? Took the crystal out of it, plugged it into the uh, R4B, and voila, the radio works. Yes, Rob? Do you have an RB75? Yes, I do. Yes. No, a 75? No, I don't. The RV-75 is the synthesized version of the RV-7, which is what is in here and in the TR-5. I do not have one of those. Uh, I would like to get one because it would make a nice marriage for this TR-8. Yes, Chuck? Uh, what's the story on how you came about the TR-8 and the XXX? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see the story. There is a, uh, a world-renowned collector of everything Drake. His name is Sidri Torp. He lives in Norway. And um, 
I heard through the grapevine that uh, Sidri was trying to reduce uh, his herd. So I wrote him an email and I asked him, I said, I understand you have some developmental radios that were going to be the TR-8. And if you were interested in taking, um, uh, to reduce your herd, you know, just, I'm, I'm trying to help you out. <laughs> to reduce your herd, I'd be interested in getting them. So we corresponded back and forth. We settled on a deal and he shipped me the, what I call the TR-7B, the TR-8 prototype, and the L85 uh, amplifier. He shipped those to me, along with a power supply and a tube for this amplifier. That's how I got it. And when those boxes came, ha have you ever noticed that the FedEx ladies are about this big? <laughs> She was struggling with it, and I knew what it was from. I said, here, dear, let me help you with that. And because uh, I, I certainly didn't want it to come all this way and get dropped on my front porch. <laughs> anyway, that's the story, Chuck. Okay. That's how it worked. Now, does Sidri have any more TR8s? I asked him that question, and he says, I don't think so. <laughs> I also asked if there was any... Um, documentation and he said no there was none that I have and I don't know of anybody who would have it that's when I contacted John Kreiner to see if he had any of that and he said no it's all been it's all gone yes Ron did you ever ask him how it made it all the way to Norway from Ohio uh, I don't know that question you did do you well, I know he came to Dayton several times, and these radios, these radios were at Dayton. That's the story. Huh? That's, that's, where, and that's the story, because when I used to go to Dayton on a regular basis way back when, Drake dumped all of the parts at Dayton. In the 90s, he was coming to Dayton two or three years oh. before it kind of dropped off. No, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, if you wanted Drake parts back then? Well, when I got married, uh, I got off the air uh, for 19 years, I was I was busy with other things, <laughs> starting a business, having five children, blah blah blah, the whole thing. Uh, so when I got back on the air, I still had my R4B, right? I still had it, and a in a in a Heathkit SB400 transmitter. So I said, what what else do you need, right? Yeah. You just you put up an antenna and get on the air, which I did. So. Uh, when I moved to where I am right now and my best neighbor and I saw all the stuff that he's got, I said, man, I, I, keeping up with the Joneses is going to be really difficult. Around, <laughs> around here. So anyway, it's been fun. I like working on these old radios because even at this stage, I learned something and I, I always like to do that. Uh, each morning when I wake up, I check my pillow and I look for little yellow spots to make sure nothing has leaked out. Uh, and when I can't find anything, I feel good. That's good. Let's go work on some more drinks. Yes, Rob? According to that Drake history book, whatever the exact name is, that Gibby at Universal Service in Columbus told Bob Drake he'd buy the first 100 one is, is, is that That's correct. correct. Yes. Well, what he did is he, is he, he didn't have the name. At that point, Drake did not have a name in the ham radio market. I mean, they sold some Q multipliers and they sold a, a, a phone patch and they sold a, a couple of other little things like that. But they didn't sell any radios. This was their first radios. And when he, when he produced this 1A and he put it on the bench to Universal and a couple of the other guys, they said, well, what is that? Where's the rest of the radio? They didn't, they didn't believe it was a real radio because up until that time, you would need two men to pick up these radios to put it in your car. So they believed in, in Mr. Drake and made the gamble, took the 1As and sold them. And <coughs> when the word got out that you didn't have to be uh, a Samson 
to be able to operate and pick up these radios, I mean, they, they sold. And, and of course, then history would show that that was a good move. Any other questions? Yes, John. Who at Drake, up until at least the mid-90s, was able to squeak out some of these prototypes when they were out of the market? I don't know whether it was a single person. Uh, it was an endeavor that Mr. Drake started. And before it, uh, as I understand, before it ever was consummated, his son, he died, and his son took over the business. So there was almost a side effort to, to develop the, uh, the next generation. Was his son a ham? I don't know. Rob, do you know that? I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether he was a ham or not. But then he was darn committed to his dad to carry out his last wishes. Then. Well, I mean, his, this, you know, they, they produced radios up until uh, the late 80s. And, um, but they just decided that, you know, they were, they were, had a, a whole factory full of folks putting these radios together and they weren't selling very many of them. But the money was in the satellite. Well, they, th it, it kept the Drake company going for many years, yeah. not ham radio. Yeah, but then whoever was there said, we still would like to do some work on ham radios and they managed to get money out of Well, them. there was this fellow, Mr. Kugler and Mr. Lassant, uh, John Kreiner was there. Um, a couple of other folks who I forget now, they were there, and they were probably the ones who kept the, the ham radio uh, end of Drake alive until it was pull out the tanks and roll over them. Any other questions? Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I want, to thank, I want to thank my neighbor for going through the trouble of putting all this together. Uh, this is, where else can you get stuff like this? <clears throat> you don't know how many lashings and beatings I got every time I went to David's house and he reminded me every time about me letting his TR-8 go away <laughs> at that ham fest. And so... I had my antenna up listening, trying to find out if anybody knew about the TR-8. And one day, I got a note from a, a Drake collector that gave me the name of the fella that had this. And I immediately ran across my lot into his backyard, screaming this guy's email address to make sure my neighbor would buy this radio. In fact, I, I made you buy it. Because I had to get out from the box. I mean, it, it, it was just terrible. But anyway, it couldn't have gone to a better home, I can tell you.